This is the lecture for Thursday, the fifth of the sixth of January, two thousand twenty-two, uh, for ancient and medieval history. And just remember, can't resist saying this. According to the media, it's January sixth, a year ago, the country almost went down in flames because of the insurrection. Whereas the media, in talking about that three-hour riot, said conversely about practically nine straight months of riot in Portland, Oregon, and Seattle, which include no police zones, where buildings burned and people were murdered. I'm talking multiple people. They were just peaceful protests. Hey, they were Antifa. They were peaceful. And the Black Lives Matter protests uh, in... Um, Minneapolis. They, they were peaceful protests. Again, even though people, multiple, died and buildings burned. But none of that matters in the face of a man in a buffalo mask with red, white, and blue face paint shouting like a moron while running through the halls of Congress. Does anyone wish to talk about this before we move on? Because I was stupid enough to introduce the topic, and fair is fair. Please. So... I think one of the biggest differences is that this, the riot on this day last year was actually at the Capitol trying to stop the counting of the election, which is not a very good thing to do for like our, demo our democratic republic. Okay, that is a good point. I'm not even going to contest it. A lot of people see that as the difference. Um, trying to stop uh, the certification of Joe Biden as president. Um, it was, most of the people didn't go into the Capitol, and most of the people uh, were protesting the selection of Biden, given some erection, election irregularities, but it was a direct response to an electoral controversy, whereas the BLM stuff and the Antifa stuff was not. Point taken. Is that fair? Am I being a jerk? No. I'll be it in other ways, don't worry. Uh, does anyone else wish to say anything uh, about this day in history? Yet. Okay. So we move back thousands of years to Rome. And <clears throat> we have talked about the Romans having a deep suspicion of human nature, being very, very certain that absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's a Shakespeare quote, but it does define the Roman attitude about power. When the Republic is established, the principle of no kings in Rome was actually codified into law, whereas Romans are expected to use deadly force when necessary to stop a person from trying to seize total power, kingly power, royal power. And to prevent the temptation of royal power, the government of Rome divided power scrupulously, very precisely, and very carefully, so that no office holder was going to have too much of it. So, let's look at the way they divided up power. First of all, there was the Committee of the Centuries, or the Assembly of the Centuries, which is basically representatives of clans and neighborhoods within Rome. And they weren't exactly a lower house legislature because they had much more restricted powers than, say, our Congress does or the British House of Commons. But they dealt with a lot of local issues, neighborhood issues. Then there was the Roman Senate. The Roman Senate was the primary decision-making body of the Roman Republic. The Senate composed uh, or comprised the leading men in Rome. At first, entirely upper class. As time goes on, that upper class nature changes so that some middle and even a couple of lower class uh, at least originating in the lower class, senators were chosen. The Roman legions will mark, un march under the standards S, P, Q, 
QR. And their legionary eagles are on top of it. That is a very sketchy eagle. <laughs> now, SPQR stands for Senatus Populus K de Roma. Yes? Um, does the assembly of centuries have anything to do with centurions? Centurion, they both talk about the hundreds. That's where the word century comes from. It's why we call a hundred years a century. But no, it's it's more like the Committee of the Hundreds. It's sort of a euphemistic name. Centurions command a hundred men in a Roman legion. And they're, loyal, they're sort of like first sergeants. They're uh, very, without the centurions, the Roman legions wouldn't work. Without sergeants, our military wouldn't work. You need Very important. So, good question, though. Senatus Populus Ke Roma, the Senate and people of Rome. And in the name of the Senate and people of Rome, even under the empire, the legions marched under that standard. So, Long ago, when I was considering buying a vanity plate, I thought very hard about getting SPQR as my vanity plate, just because I like Roman history. But in the end, I decided that would be a mistake. The Roman Senate decides issues of peace and war, major domestic policy, major foreign policy, any big decision that's going to come down the pike and face the Romans is going to be decided in the Senate. Welcome. Isn't it fun to come to school today? <sighs> I waited until after 6 a.m. to see if any announcement came. And my wife was looking for the next hour while I shoveled the damn darn driveway. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like shoveling. I don't like exercise. And the snow made me exercise. So. Yeah, it's like snow flowers, eat some gas, you can just like pump up the I ground. have one. But the problem is, because I didn't want it stolen, it's in my backyard behind a fence that's now locked in place by the ice. Next year I'm going to do things differently. But for now, I've got a shovel. Um, what topic do you want? Take a moment, we'll come back to you. Everyone else in here chose their topic. Do you have your list? Okay. Just give this back when you're done, or give them back, whatever. <laughs> Okay, and uh, when you're ready, raise your hand, okay? Uh, don't forget. So, the Senate is the fulcrum around which every major decision in the Roman Republic is going to be made. So, kind of important. But a committee makes a lousy executive. There are times when you need somebody to decide. Now, everyone who has ever had ever, any kind of power knows this. You do not ever want to have a council run your city. I've seen it. And councils are good for deliberating laws and, and discussing ideas and express, representing factions. But if you've got a major crisis, you don't want a council in charge. You want a single person or a single clear executive. I'll close the window. Well, the Romans understood this. But they also understood that there would be a problem if an executive took on that role and liked the power too much so that they wouldn't leave. By the way, the last few election cycles, everyone wonders. You know, when Obama was elected, will George W. Bush, Bush relinquish office? Of course he would. When Obama left office, Republicans, I didn't really try to buy into this much. Well, will Obama just hold on to power? Will he just, or will he relinquish office? Of course he will. Uh, the last time, will Trump would relinquish office? A lot of people were unsure of that. Yeah, he did. Of course he did. And when the time comes, Biden will relinquish office when his term ends or something else happens. So the fear, he's a very old fellow, okay? I'm not wishing anything bad on the man. I never want my political enemies to be assassinated. 
because that makes them into martyrs. I want my political enemy's ideas to be defeated. I wish them him a long and happy life, eating ice cream on his in his basement. I I, I wish him all the happiness. I do, but. He's so big. He, oh, he talked about our president that way. Don't you have any decor? Do you know what they talked about with Trump? Okay, you, you have people on so-called news shows holding the severed head of the president in effigy as a form of protest. Oh, never mind. Yeah, it's saying let's let's go, Brandon. It's somehow controversial. Ah, uh, okay. I, it's, it's the exercise, it's the snowboard that I couldn't do, so I had to shovel. The Romans know they need an executive. How are they going to handle this? Because they're afraid of giving one man too much power. I know! Let's have two guys do it. Yeah, we're going to appoint every year two consuls. And these consuls are going to have supreme executive power. But what if they disagree? <laughs> Let me tell you about them disagreeing. In peacetime, the consuls preside over the Senate, or at least work with the leadership of the Senate. But in wartime, and this is where we get Washington and the president as commander-in-chief of our military, each of the consuls is commander-in-chief of the Roman military. Now, sometimes they divide this up, uh, whereas one consul controls this region's military and another consul controls the other region's military, depending upon the war. But in the Second Punic War, when the Carthaginian general Hannibal comes this close to conquering Rome, destroys a Roman army at the Battle of Cannae about three times its size, Hannibal's a dangerous, dangerous guy, and his army is a very good army. One of the Roman consuls one year is named Fabius, and later he's called Fabius Cuncator which means Fabius, the guy who frustrates the enemy, roughly. Fabius knew that he needed to stay close enough to Hannibal's army to kill their scouts and to mess with their foraging for food and to just be a plausible threat. But he never wanted to get too close because if he got too close, like getting too close to a shark or a bear, Hannibal will bite and then it's over. So what Fabius would do is try to modulate his army's location relative to Hannibal. Hannibal advances, he retreats. Hannibal retreats, he advances, trying to keep a certain distance. However, one year, Fabius's partner was a much more aggressive fellow. Get the Carthies, get the Carthies, get the Carthies. And the way they divided power was every other day, each other was in command. So when the aggressive consul was in command, assuming that the Carthaginians are over here, the Roman army would march as quickly as possible towards the Carthaginians. And then the next day, Fabius would be in command, and the army would march as quickly as possible away from the Carthaginians. And this went on back and forth for months. But that was the law. No one person is going to be given too much power at any moment because that person might make themselves king. So you literally have this silly situation of the slinky Roman army. Boop, 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 because the, the consuls were in absolute disagreement. And the Romans say, for, you know, for, for, in most cases, that's fine. But even the Romans must admit something. There are times when you can't mess around like that. The Gauls are crossing the bridge, or they're trying to. Rome's on fire. Um, we have a, a, a serious riot that could overthrow the, the Republic. Some kind of truly existential threat. The Romans are not going to be satisfied with having two guys who might squabble. So, the Roman Constitution, such as it was, allows for the office of dictator. Dictator literally means he who tells, the guy who tells things, tells people what to do. He dictates. And the term dictator is still used today. But Roman dictators are a heck of a lot different than Kim Jong-un in North Korea. 
Today, dictator refers to anyone who rules without legitimacy through total power and fear and, and brutality. So Kim Jong-un is a dictator. Um, uh, let's see, the, the current president of, Russia, of, uh, of, uh, of Belarus is a dictator. Um, throughout much of Africa and parts of Asia, like in Burma, there, there, there is a dictatorship, but it's a committee of generals that run it. Call me Admar now, but I won't call it that. Um, so you're giving this dictator total power? Yep. He can do whatever he wants. Yep. He doesn't have to consult the Senate. Nope. He doesn't have to keep his decisions within the traditions of Roman law. Not while he's in charge. So the dictator has more power even than a normal king does. <clears throat> because Romans imagined there were times, there would be times, when you need <clears throat> to make a decision. You have one guy in charge because things are that dangerous, that dicey. However, dictators were appointed for no more than six months. The presumption is that any crisis bad enough to suspend freedom and the balance of power should be resolved within six months. If it's not, there's something wrong. Either we lose and are destroyed, in which case nobody cares, or we win and we restore consular government and the Senate and all that other stuff. So the first restraint on dictatorial power is a very, very, very hardcore term limit. Six months, that's it. As the Roman Republic in its latter days becomes corrupt, the term is fudged. The Senate is allowed to extend the term of a dictator beyond six months for the duration of the emergency. And that's just a step towards making Lucius Cornelius Sulla dictator for life, which is basically like king, only more so. But when the Republic was healthy, the office of dictator had a firm maximum limit of six months, and it might be less than that. Here's the other thing that limits dictatorial power. During his term of office, if the dictator makes a law that every male Roman was, must wear a conical purple felt hat with a yellow feather in it and call each other Susan on Tuesdays. That's it. Every Roman man was, must wear a conical purple felt hat with a yellow feather on and call each other Susan on Tuesdays. Because he's the dictator and he has the power to do that. However, after his term of office, he could be sued in the courts for violating Rome's constitution. And if the courts decide that, in fact, he did overstep, I mean, it's a pretty hard sell to say that the survival of the Senate and people of Rome require all men to wear conical felt hats with a yellow feather in it and call each other Susan every Tuesday. I mean, maybe there's some kind of weird, demoniacal werewolf, you know, vampire creature that is somehow repelled by purple conical felt hats with yellow feathers in it, and when they hear, they hear the name Susan, they recoil like a vampire against a crucifix. Possibly that's true, but you'd have to demonstrate that in a court. So a Roman dictator is given total power, but within very narrow limits. Maximum six-month term, and he can be sued after leaving office. It's a good system, and it worked. Now, I'm going to tell you about the bestest, I'm serious, the best dictator in human history, by far. The best dictator. If we had to have a dictator, I would want somebody like him. So I'm not going to talk about Mao Zedong, or Joseph Stalin, or Adolf Hitler, or Kim Jong-un, or any of the catalog of, of monsters throughout history. I'm not going to even talk about Napoleon or Alexander, because they weren't dictated. Well, Napoleon was an emperor and Alexander was a king, but no, I'm going to talk about a guy who Cincinnati, Ohio is named after. His name is Kinkinatus. 
Kinkinatus is also who Washington was called. Washington is the American Kinkinatus. So here's the broad strokes of the story of the best dictator ever. Rome is beset by barbarian invaders in the Etruscan lands marching towards Rome. Rome has sent armies after these invaders and the armies have gotten crushed. Rome is threatened with complete destruction. The Roman Senate votes dictatorial powers to a retired senator and general and consul named Kinkinatus. Where is he? He's out on his farm, growing turnips. So the Senate senators send a delegation to tell Kinkinatus he's in charge, save us, please. And they come out to his farm wearing their nice bleached togas, you know, really, really, really bright white. And they find him working in his turnip field, up to his knees and more in muck. That's mud and fertilizer. Working on his turnips. And they call to him, Kinkinatus, Kinkinatus, and he looks up. And almost like a Maine farmer says, yeah, which is what Mainers say. It's a, it's a Maine thing. And he walks up to the senators. Yeah. King Canadas, King Canadas, barbarians have invaded. They're in the Etruscan lands. If you don't, the senators voted you supreme powers. Please take command and save us. Yeah. So he gets onto his horse without cleaning up and rides to where the army is. He spends a few weeks training up the army to his standards, and his standards are incredibly hardcore. And he has a plan that the army is trained to do. After a few weeks of training for his kind of battle, the army meets the barbarians. And in a very close-run battle, King Kinatus breaks the spirit of the barbarians, breaks the back of their power, sends them reeling northward in chaos and defeat. And just after it's clear that the barbarians are really, really defeated, he doesn't even return to Rome. He looks at the generals and the senators who, is part, who are part of his command post and says, going home now, bye. And he leaves. He goes back home. Think about that. This is a man who is given something that power-hungry people everywhere would love. And he has six months. But he doesn't even wait until the enemy is completely gone. He just waits till he's sure that the enemy is not going to reform and come back. He doesn't go to Rome. He doesn't have, you know, a, a triumph. He, he just says, I'm done. I'm going back to my turnips. Because he doesn't want the power. He doesn't need the power. He wants to be on his farm growing his turnips. That is the best dictator ever. He's not somebody who wants the power. He's not somebody that gets some kind of gratification by every, having everyone else obey him and bow and scrape and say, oh, yes, sir, you're right, boss. No, he's not that kind of guy. He is the best dictator ever because he does the job until it's no longer necessary for there to be a dictator and immediately gives that power up. Now, George Washington. In the American Revolution, there is one person that people north and south, and yeah, there was a big divide between northerners and southerners in the Revolution. Northerners didn't like slavery, southerners used slavery. Northerners tended to be town folk, southerners tended to focus on their big plantations that grew tobacco and later cotton. They both didn't like the British, but they didn't like each other much either. But a planter from Virginia who had fought in the French and Indian Wars, really tall guy in the above six foot range, and that was tall in those days, named George Washington, was appointed by the Northerners to be the commander of the military. And this made the Southerners happy. Now, Washington was a good general, but not a great one. Washington was... A reliable guy. Washington didn't even win. He wasn't even at the most important battle of the American Revolution, the Battle of Saratoga. The battle of Saratoga stopped an attack uh, that was, so was split the New England from the rest of the colonies. That was a different commander. Yeah. Um, isn't that like wasn't George Washington's like first 
like attack on the British was like a complete failure. Yeah. Yeah. No, he had problems. And the British chased Washington from Boston through New York and out into New Jersey and, and ultimately to Valley Forge. I mean, no, Washington's early general and even his later generalship wasn't inspired. It was sort of work a day. I mean, it's like if you have a cook making a meal, Washington could be relied on to produce something, you know, with that's hot and brown and there's plenty of it. But don't expect uh, gourmet cooking from him. He's not going to do that. That wasn't his strength. Washington's strength was that he was trusted. He was the kind of guy that inspired trust. He didn't need to be the smartest man in the room. He didn't need to win every little argument. What you could trust Washington to do was to make a wise and fair decision. Even if you didn't agree with it, you would accept that it is a wise and fair decision. The only one who didn't do that is actually the man who saved America, Benedict Arnold. Benedict Arnold saved this country at the Battle of Valcour Island very early in the Revolution. But Arnold never got the kind of respect that he thought he was due. And Washington made him commander of the base at West Point. And Arnold thought it was an insult. So what does Arnold do? Ar Arnold connives with the British to betray the Revolution. Arnold was probably a more brilliant general than Washington, but he was not a more trustworthy patriot. In any case, Washington wins the war with the help of the French. Now, King George is gone. Let's have King George of Virginia. And the Continental Congress and the leadership of the revolution offer Washington the throne of the United States. And Washington says, no, I did not fight King George the third of the House of Hanover to become King George the first of the House of Washington. This is nonsense. No, I will not be your king. Uh, well, well, why don't you be the head of the Church of the United States? <laughs> Remember this when somebody talks separation of church and state. What is the Church of the... Well, it doesn't exist. But... Remember, there was a big and powerful Church of England. And when America breaks away from the Church of England, the Church of England, which today is called the Episcopalian Church in the United States, uh, no longer is going to have the King of England as their leader, because that sort of defeats the purpose of the revolution. So why not have the Church of England in the colonies become a church of the U.S. with Washington sort of as its, his overriding figure? And Washington just looks at them. Oh, you guys disturb me. You, you really do. Sure, you, I'm not a priest. I'm not a minister. That's not my calling. No! I'm not going to be the head of the Church of the United States. And so there is no Church of the United States. So then they come to him. Why don't you be president? Okay, you'll be our chief executive, and you'll have consular powers, and there won't be any way. And, and, and you could be, you know, sort of the, 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 the leading figure uh, in, a, in, a, in a republic system. And Washington says, okay. And they say, president for life? And he says, stop it! <laughs> no, I'm not going to be president for damn life. No. I'll run for president. And he runs for president, and he wins. I mean, everyone in the colonies, north and south, most everyone trusts him. And then four years later, 1792, he runs for re-election and wins. 1796 comes along. <laughs> he doesn't run. <laughs> but we need you. What's gonna what are we gonna be without you? No, I'm not running. I'm going home. My vice president's gonna run, John Adams. Thomas Jefferson's gonna run against him. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. There are a lot of wise people, except for the ones that made wanted to make me head of the Church of the United States. They're not quite wise. But most everyone else is wise enough to do this job. I'm going home to Valley Forge. And that's what he does. He is the American King Canutters. Didn't like before the eight year rule was established, um, all like a bunch of presidents like John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, they all kind of just stayed in eight years to respect what Washington did? Yes, absolutely. Look, the only president that didn't was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And there are issues with Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I, I respect what he did in World War II. But what kind of ego says no one else can do this job? I mean, yeah, World War II had started, but we weren't involved with it yet. 
Still, I suppose it's a good thing that he that he that he that he was our president in World War II because he made decisions that helped us that helped us really win. Other people might not have. But yet everyone else before Franklin Roosevelt in the nineteen in 1940, everyone else said two terms is enough for me. If it's enough for George Washington, even Andrew Jackson, who was the head of a one-party state, the United States in the time of Andrew Jackson had one political party, the Democratic Republicans. And the man was a dictator. Not only did the man wage biological warfare against the Indians, but Andrew Jackson said to the Supreme Court, Mr. Chief Justice Marshall of the Supreme Court has made his ruling. Now let's see him enforce it. Ha, ha, ha. Because the president was not going to listen to what the Supreme Court said. And he didn't. And he got away with it. When he was insulted by people, he would challenge them to duels and kill them. Okay, this was the president of the United States in the 1830s. Andrew Jackson, scary, scary man, and he's on our money. Um, he won the Battle of New Orleans, which was good, but ooh, politician, even he didn't run for a third term. I'm sure he thought about it, but he didn't do it. So you're absolutely right. And after Roosevelt, after Franklin Roosevelt uh, died in office in 1945, the Congress then said, "We, we don't, we don't want to do this ever again." So then, they, 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 the, the constitutional amendment was proposed and went through the process and was passed, and uh, now it is uh, illegal for a president to run for a third term. That long. Hmm? I forgot it took that long to like actually. It did, and it, yeah, it was the late 1940s when it happened. Now, um, President beep beep beep. If a president starts out as somebody else's vice president, and if the president dies or has to leave office in the any anywhere in the middle of their term, the vice president can then be the president for the rest of that president's term and run and then run again. But if the vice president becomes president early in the term, I'm not sure. I honestly don't remember. Maybe any some of you do. If, uh, say, God forbid, George uh, uh, Joe Biden had to leave office in March of 2021, last year, and Harris became VP, assuming that she could win election in 2024, would she be able to run in 2028? I don't know. Because she would have served most of Biden's term as well as her own first term. I don't know. I, I know that the, the, the amount, yes. Wasn't there a guy who, like, it was literally, like, two or three weeks into office, like, he died? Yeah, that was um, William Henry Harrison. Uh, Harrison, and this is the 1840s, um, Harrison is a great general against the Indians, but he decides he's going to give a Roman-esque, a Roman-like three-and-a-half-hour inauguration speech in the middle of a snowstorm. He gets a cold and dies. Don't do that. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to remind you of that, considering today's this should have, in my opinion, might have been a snow day. Um, uh, the, but nobody gives me that kind of power. <laughs> That's probably a good thing. So yeah, uh, John Tyler becomes president and serves most of his term. And Tyler is the antithesis of Harrison. But the, Harrison picked Tyler to be his VP to sort of balance out the ticket. So America voted for one kind of guy and got a completely different kind of president because the guy insisted on making a long speech in the snow. Okay, so American King Canadas, George Washington, because he refused to become the ruler of America for life. Okay, at the beginning, Rome has two social classes. The patricians are the landowners, the upper class. They are the wealthy, the powerful, the leading families, the aristocrats. Those are the patricians. My mom's name is Patricia. If you know a guy named Patrick or Patricia, or, or, or a female named Patricia, you, you know somebody whose name basically means noble. Noble, noble of spirit, noble of aspect, noble. So, next time you talk to Pat... Remind them that their name means, ask them what their name means. They should know. And if they don't, tell them. It means noble. So patricians are the upper class in Rome. In the early days, the lower classes are the plebeians. The plebeians, also called the plebs for short. The plebeians are everyone from family farmers to blacksmiths to carpenters to day laborers. 
The plebeians are the people who are not wealthy, who are not high class, who are not powerful. But they do the work that makes Rome go. And early in its history, the patricians and the plebeians really kept separate. The patricians, for example, I mean, look, today, if you've got a guy who's in love with a girl, and the guy's from the wrong side of the tracks, and the girl is from one of the leading families in town, but she loves him and he loves her, her family is not going to let them get married if they can have anything to say. And in, in olden times, they did. So, no, you're not going to marry my daughter. In fact, I don't even want you dating my daughter. Why? How can I put this diplomatic? You're scum! You come from scum. You're going to scum. You're scum. I'm not going to let my daughter marry social scum. No! Today, that's a little more open. It's a little more negotiable. But even today, every dad that I've ever known, uh, including my father-in-law, uh, never found a man that was worthy of his daughter, or at least it's a, it's a rare father-in-law. I mean, you might have a general who's a father-in-law, and he has a daughter, and there's a, a guy who's a hero from battle, and he wants to marry his daughter, and the general would say, yep, you're the man for my girl. But in general terms, it, that doesn't happen often. Most dads say nobody's good enough for my little girl. So, social, social stratification. Hey, Dan. Aww. Wasn't it fun coming to school today? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, take out your list of um, topics, and in a few minutes, I'm going to have you choose. Okay? Both of you. Oh, okay. Uh -oh. For your thing. They've already chosen. Uh -oh. But you're still ahead of everyone in periods four and five. I am. Yes. <laughs> But she gets to choose first, because she was here before you, but late. Okay, stratification is things settle out in layers. So if you see a sedimentary rock that has a yellow layer and an orange layer and a brown layer and a, you know, a yellow layer, and that stratification settles out. So if you make a blended drink, like a, a smoothie or a milkshake, and you let it sit there for too long, what will happen is it will settle out into different layers. If you ever drink milk on a farm that hasn't been homogenized, you know what happens? It settles into layers. I, when I worked as a dairy uh, on a dairy farm as a farmhand, one of the great benefits was they had the milk in a, a refrigerator, almost a freezer, it's really cold. And you're out working in the field, but you, you could nip in and get a drink. And this drink had uh, lighter milk and then heavier milk and then the, the cream on top. Believe it or not, the, the densest stuff floated to the top with milk. It still does. How many of you have had non-homogenized milk? Yeah, I, I like it. It's, it's neat. It's, it's not something I have very often, but it's cool. It's interesting. Yeah. It's like a weird texture. It is. It is. Uh, so that's stratification. So the plebeians are under the patricians. <laughs> uh, I suppose um, it would get irritating after a while to be a plebeian and not let your, you know, you're insulted because you're scum compared to the patricians and they tell you what to do and you have fewer rights. Oh, and if there's a court of law decision to be made, you are going to get the short end of the stick. You're going to lose. Not because you're wrong, not because they're right, but because they're a patrician and you're a plebeian. The social order is reinforced in the justice system. So the plebeians go on strike. They leave. All the plebeians one day get up and leave Rome because they're sick of being treated like second-class citizens. They go to another hilltop, they set up their own plebeian town, and they, you know, they start building things. And the patricians at first are like, yeah, fine, uh, better without those scum. But nobody does any of the work that needs to be done now. And now the patricians have to do it themselves. And they don't want to. And they don't like it. And they're not good at it. Yes? Didn't they also leave, like, in the face of an invasion? I'm telling it more in the social, but yeah. yeah. Uh, there was a need for them. And so the patricians finally send representatives from the Senate to plebeian town and say, okay, look, let's make this right. What do we need to do to bring you back? And the plebeians say a couple of things. First off, we want equality under the law, period. The law should not be about who you are. It should be about what you do. 
We should be treated equally in the courts, and our cases should be judged on their merits, not on our social class. And the senators uh, agree. Secondly, we want the law written for everyone to see. We want the law publicly available. Now, yeah, most of us can't read, but we can hire scribes. That's what they do. Scribes are like people who read combined with accountants combined with lawyers. Scribes are there to make sure that uh, accounts are kept and that legal contracts are honored. So we want the law printed out and publicly available so there's no shenanigans, and the senators agree. So the plebeians come back, everything works out, and the 12 tables are set up. And the 12 tables are literally 12 stone tables with the laws of Rome carved into them. And they're out in public for everyone to see. So let's say I'm a glass blower and I want to know what the law is regarding a certain kind of property. I hire a scribe, we go to the 12 tables and he reads it to me. What if he lies? Well, there are other scribes and there are other people there. And unless he pays off everyone forever, I'm going to find out that he lied to me, and then his reliability as a scribe will be undermined and he'll lose his business. So he's going to read to me what's on the 12 tables. The 12 tables is about the law being public so that everyone knows the rules, and the rules can't be changed, and so that everyone can be treated equally under the law. And the 12 tables is an important step to the development of freedom in the United States. It's one of the ancestors of our Constitution. There's something else they get, too. They get the Tribune of the Plebs, and we'll talk about them next time. Any questions, comments, thoughts? Okay. Then I will stop the lecture. Bye. Uh, remember, Chapter 5 is due Monday.